Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on the Inside Winston Cup Racing. I'm at the Bristol International Raceway, where the Food City 500 is scheduled for this afternoon. Will it be a Chevrolet again? Or can Ford break into the victory lane? Or maybe Pontiac? Each of those brands are qualified in the first three positions. Randy Pemberton is in our studio in Charlotte, North Carolina, with a qualifying report and other news from Bristol. And good morning, Randy. Good morning, Ned, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the pre-race edition of IWCR for Sunday, April 2nd. Today, the Winston Cup Tour hits the high banks of Bristol, Tennessee. We'll have a report on qualifying and other news from Bill Weber. Also on this morning's show, we'll have a candid conversation with Dale Jarrett, driver of the Haviland Fords. And we'll take you to a test session with Mike Wallace and Jeff Burton as they try to get a jump on the upcoming race at North Wilkesboro. Today's show is brought to you by Texaco Haviland Formula 3 Motor Oil. Add more life to your car. Cold-filtered Miller Genuine Draft, making the world a very cool place. And by Goodyear, number one in racing, number one in tires. This segment of IWCR is brought to you by Texaco Haviland Formula 3. Add more life to your car. With only 36 cars in the field for today's Food City 500, that means that a few more teams than usual had to head for home early. Who were they? Let's go to Bill Weber, who filed this report after final practice yesterday. Thanks, Randy, and welcome to Bristol, Tennessee, everyone, where the weather's been cool, the fans have been great, and as we've come to expect, things have been rather unpredictable. Just getting through inspection was the first challenge. Several cars were flagged for improper camber, including the Kellogg Chevy, Skull Ford, and MBNA Pontiac. All missed first round qualifying. Mark Martin was the final car to run on Friday and the fastest, nudging Jeff Gordon from the pole at 124.6 miles per hour. You know, I used to sit on a lot of poles, and we haven't, that's not our strong suit anymore. It's not my strong suit anymore, and, and uh, we make no apologies for that. We race better on Sunday than we ever used to, you know, but uh, it's not as easy for us to sit on poles nowadays, and uh, I knew that we had a shot at it and, and uh, reached in deep. Bristol isn't one of Kyle Petty's favorite tracks, but he was a qualifying surprise. Kyle starts third. It's not that I don't like it. I just have bad luck here. You know what I mean? We either run good here or we crash, and there's no in-between. And, you know, you just dread going to places where you have that kind of luck, and it just kind of follows you around. It's like a big cloud that follows me to Darlington and to, to Bristol. David Green subbed for Bobby Labonte and qualified the Interstate Battery Chevrolet fifth. Labonte has a broken shoulder blade but will start the car. Well, you know, feel fine. Just uh, got just a little wounded wing there, but you know, other than that, everything's good. Just a tough place on it, but uh, got uh, got a good relief driver and uh, probably start the race and uh, get out first caution, go from there. Do you think he can make it to the first caution, Bobby, or is it just going to be a time factor? Well, it'll probably be a time factor. I mean, it just depends on when that first caution might be, so just kind of uh, uh, play it by ear, really. Loy Allen has left the Hooters team. Hutt Strickland sat in this weekend but failed to qualify. Mike Wallace, Jeremy Mayfield, Joe Nemechek, and Steve Kinzer also went home. NASCAR conducted wind tunnel tests this week on a Chevy, Ford, and Pontiac, but it will be a while before we get the valuable numbers. In final practice, Jeff Bodine spun down pit road after losing an oil gasket. Ricky Rudd got in the oil and brushed the wall in the tied Ford. Greg Sachs lost an oil line but saved the motor. All three will be ready for the green flag. Now, Chevrolet is looking to make it six straight wins to start the season. Unofficially, the fastest car in final practice might have been Terry Labonte. Of course, to win this race, he'll have to overcome the handicap of pitting on the backstretch. But we've already seen that once this weekend. Green flag shortly after 1.10 Eastern time. Randy, back to you. Thanks, Bill. Well, it should be a beautiful day for racing today. Temperature only expected to climb to about a cool 60. Let's take a week look at this week's top 10 qualifiers. Mark Martin hoping for the first Ford win of the year. Jeff Gordon, if he can get out of these next three short track races with any kind of finish, that team can start talking championship. Kyle Petty goes off third. Fourth, Derek Cope, the surprise of the season. Bobby Labonte will start the car today, but he's expected to give way to David Green early. Ted Musgrave goes off sixth. Ricky Craven, seventh. Good qualifying effort for him. Likewise for Johnny Andretti in eighth. Rusty Wallace, you'd expect him to run well. He's won three of the last six spring races at Bristol. Rounding out the top ten is Jeff Burton. Yesterday, the Bush Series cars got a crack at the high banks at Bristol. There was some uh, good racing, but there was also a lot of caution flags. Steve Grisson was able to miss them all, and uh, he went on in the closing laps to take the win. Let's take a look at the highlights. National champion. 
David Green led the 36 car field to the green flag to get the Goodies 250 underway, but Green's day would go away early when the 1994 Bush Series champion slowed suddenly with a sour clutch. He hit pit road and handed the lead to last week's winner, Larry Pearson. Pearson, Mark Martin, and Chad Little began to pull away from the pack until caution number two slowed the race as Tracy Leslie lost it on the back stretch on lap 21. Shortly after going green, Pearson pushed up the track, giving the lead to Martin. The one-groove racetrack took its toll, and by the time Larry got back in line, he was 10th. Bristol was its normal self. Ten yellow flags forced the race to be run under yellow for 40 of the race's 250 circuits. It continued to be a single-file racetrack throughout the day, get in the way, and go around. The worst wreck of the afternoon came when Tim Fedua found Jim Bown off of turn four. Suddenly, the front stretch was strewn with cars, including Hermie Sadler, Dennis Setzer, Bobby Dotter, and several others. It was under that yellow that everyone hit pit road for four tires and fuel. Martin got out first, followed by Little, and the man on the move, 1993 Bush Series champ Steve Grissom. Grissom got off of pit road and onto the track in third and started to make a run for his first win since 1993. From lap 86 through 250, none of the front runners pitted again. There were a few more cautions just to make it interesting, like this crash involving Rick Wilson and Bobby Hamilton. Mark continued to show the way around the high banks at Bristol through the halfway and at lap 200. He was followed by Grissom, who had moved into second around Chad Little. Chad was followed by Kenny Wallace and Terry Labonte. As the race came to a close, Grissom began to close in on Martin. Mark's tires began to fade, and Grissom got underneath with 23 laps to go. The only thing that got in Steve's way in the closing laps was this yellow on the white flag lap as Phil Parsons crashed off of turn four. Grissom was able to weed his way through and hold off Martin for his first win since 1993. Bush Cars, April 15th at the Hickory Motor Speedway. It'll be live here on TNN. We need to take a break as we leave you. Here's the rest of the lineup for today's Food City 500. Ned will be back in a moment. We're at the Robert Yates Racing Shops in Charlotte, North Carolina, headquarters for the Haviland Fords, which are driven by Dale Jarrett this year in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. This team has had to make a lot of adjustments over the years, first with the loss of Davey Allison and then Ernie Irvin getting injured last August in Michigan. Dale Jarrett, as we mentioned, is now the driver, and it's another adjustment period for the team. They getting used to him and him getting used to them. Bill Weber files this story on this racing team about the adjustment. Yeah, at, at times it sure is like that uh, because that, that's why you stay around this sport. I think why I do because I enjoy it because it is a lot of fun. But uh, I guess certain situations uh, get a little bit tougher and, and some of that fun goes away. It, it is a business and a serious business certainly, but uh, uh, things when things aren't going well, it, it becomes an awfully tough business to be around. Dale Jarrett has been around this tough business a long time. But in 1995, he faces the most challenging laps of his future. Robert Yates Racing blended horsepower and hard work into a winning formula that fueled the skyrocketing careers of Davey Allison and Ernie Irvin. Now Jarrett straps into the seat of the Haviland Ford, gambling with a two-headed coin. If he's successful, it's because of the car and crew. But if success turns to struggle, the perception is it must be the driver. Yeah. I knew that coming in. I mean, I, I had said that. I probably didn't say it publicly, but my wife and I had discussed that looking at the situation. But I, I really didn't care how I was perceived or anything. My concern was that I go out and do the best job that I can, and I think that this gave me opportunity to win races, and that's all that I wanted to do. That's all I care about doing is running well and, and winning races, having a good time, and uh, that, that's all. You know, if other people see that or think that, that I'm not getting the job done or I can't drive or if a, we do well it's because the car uh, is there and, and it should do well, then so be it. That doesn't really bother me. 
it's just like the day I came to this race team. You know, um, it was it was a, a challenge that I was thought I was ready to do, and um, you know, obviously Dale figures he's ready to do it, and um, you know, thought thought that he was up to it. So, you know, that's just part of it, and um, you know, you gotta you gotta set your goals pretty high. And, um, Jared's three top fives in the first five races are a solid foundation to start the season, a season in which no Ford has threatened victory lane. The timing is very important. You know, he stepped in probably at a great time. I mean, fours were good, our car was good, our engines were good, and Ernie was good. So now it's a year later. Dale's in the car. Chevrolet's are a lot better. Maybe our engines aren't quite what we'd like for them to be. The frustration of fielding a Ford seemed to boil over early when Jarrett was quoted in USA Today as saying he should have stayed with a Chevrolet. I'm answering 10 or 12 reporters' questions during lunch, and the question was asked if I knew how good the Monte Carlo was, would I have stayed? And I laughed and said, oh yeah, I would have probably stayed. And laughing, that wasn't put in there. But I followed it right up anyway, seriously saying, I know I made the right decision. I'm where I want to be. Robert Yates and his team are too good. You can't keep them down. They're going to find a way to be back on top, and I'm going to help them get to that point. None of that was printed. So now Jarrett brings his familiar name and some fabulous finishes to a trusted and talented team that expects to win every week. Larry McReynolds is probably the most organized person I've ever been around in my life. And he accomplishes so much in each day that it's just unbelievable. And I've learned a lot from him in that aspect. Robert Yates, uh, gosh, I always knew the man was really smart, but you know, in my book, he's, he's a genius. And uh, it's just amazing what these people know and, and what they go through to, to get to the top of this sport. It's easy to understand why Jared jumped at the chance to join this team, even if only for a year, a move that could lead to Dale forming his own team. But there has been speculation that sharing the spotlight while Ernie continues his remarkable recovery could create problems. One car, two drivers. Yeah, Ernie's like another crew chief there that has won races, so... Uh, you know, I know that he's there, and, and I'm sure that there are a lot of times that he's saying that, uh, you know, I could be doing a little bit better in there, and, and maybe he could, but all I know is that Dale Jarrett's sitting there doing the very best that he can each time that we go out. So every time Dale Jarrett rolls out, he feels the exhilaration and the self-applied pressure that comes from within a racer. Sure, the frustration meter is pegged, but pretty soon, Dale Jarrett and his Haviland Ford team expect to start having fun again. I'll be okay, you know, but uh, it looks like a lot of times around the racetrack, I think I give a uh, false pretense as to how I really feel because uh, I do a lot of thinking and I'm pretty intense. I want to win at this really bad. With the talent and resources this team has, I don't think it'll be long till you'll see this Haviland Ford back up front like it's accustomed to being. Still to come on this edition of Inside Winston Cup Racing, we'll have the mailbox and we'll also have a story on testing, so don't go away. The IWCR Mailbox is brought to you by Miller Genuine Draft. Our question is from Arthur Shannon from Barry, Vermont. Does a lightweight driver have any advantage over a heavier driver, and does the driver's weight affect the setup? Thanks for writing in. It's a good question. I'm Bill Engel, the crew chief for the number 10 Tide Ford. Um, that's kind of a hard one to answer. The only thing I would say is a crew chief, through many years of experience, a lighter car is usually the car that wins the race. The, all the cars have to weigh 3,400 pounds as we go through tech for the race, but you th a driver that weighs somewhat 50, 75 pounds lighter than another, I would say their car has a little better advantage as far as the use of tires. Uh, the lighter the weight, the less use of the tire you have, so your tires would last longer. If you have any race questions, write to us at Inside Winston Cup Racing, Box 240-417, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28224. If we use your question on the air, you'll receive this embroidered Miller Genuine Draft jacket. Qualifying becomes more and more important at NASCAR Winston Cup events, especially when you go to the short tracks when there are not as many cars in the field, not as many positions there to be taken. As a result, many of the teams do a lot of testing to prepare themselves, and we'll cover some of that testing when we come back. And as we leave you for this break, here's a look at what's coming up next week right here on IWCR. Next week, the Winston Cup circuit rolls into North Wilkesboro, 
One year ago, Terry Labonte made his return to Victory Lane. We'll have the free race report from the first Union 400. And we'll talk to the Fillmore Racing Team about the rough road to being a success in the Winston Cup Series. Derek Cope is off to a fast start this season. He's fourth in points with three top five finishes. Just part of a bright new look and a promising new outlook for Bobby Allison Motorsports. Hi, I'm Bobby Allison with the Straight Hour Ford, and I want to wish uh, Inside Winston Cup Racing and all the fans out there a good day and happy 10th anniversary. Simply making the field in NASCAR Winston Cup Racing today has become quite an accomplishment, especially for drivers and or teams that don't have a lot of experience together. What do they do about it? They go test, especially when they come to the short tracks like we're in now, Bristol this weekend, of course, North Wilkesboro next weekend, and Martinsville, Virginia the week after that. A couple of teams went to North Wilkesboro this week, and Randy Pemberton went along with them, Mike Wallace and Jeff Burton, and had an added bonus, Ernie Irvin was there with his truck. On Monday, two teams took the opportunity to test at one of the toughest tracks on the tour. No, it's not particularly tough on engines or drivers, nor are there usually very many wrecks in a North Wilkesboro race. The reason North Wilkesboro is tough, it's just flat hard to get a car to turn to a driver's liking. Well, that's what we're going to work hard on here. This is a new car. We had this car at Richmond. Qualified well, didn't race real well in the race, but... Uh... You know, we're, we're trying to learn a lot. I'm still trying to learn a lot about chassis and understand them. And uh, hopefully in a couple days here, we'll get the handle on it and get the thing to turn good and get it to make some long straightaways out of this place. Shorten up the corners the best we can. Wallace is hoping that if he can get the car to cut in the corners, he'll make the cut in qualifying. Last year, he failed to make the field at both North Wilkesboro races. Yeah, I probably think we can make a chassis change and put a set of tires on that way when we start making chassis changes we know what we're doing, you know, we're staying on the same set of tires consistently. 1994 Winston Cup Rookie of the Year Jeff Burton brought two Robestas Fords for his test and like Mike, he's trying to get through the turns a little better, but he has a handicap. What we've fought against all year long is that last year we had the Hoosiers and now we switched over and then we also switched over the weight. I haven't gotten the car to turn yet. I have not adjusted well to the Goodyear tires. Uh, and I really don't know that a lot of people that ran Hoosiers last year have adjusted very well. And we're here to try to get the car to turn better through the center. If we can get it turned better through the center, we'll be a lot better. A test session at any track is at times tedious work. Turning wrenches, changing springs, changing tires, adding spoiler, changing gears, looking at plugs, along with a hundred other adjustments all in hopes of picking up just a little time on the track. 1977. Perhaps the biggest time saver in testing is the computer. It's not legal in competition, but it seems to be a necessity at a test. What we're doing with the computer stuff and then what we take back to the racetrack on race weekend is that's helping me understand the shock travel, shock velocities, things that I'm having a little bit of a hard time picking up. You know, there's people like Rusty who's really great on chassis and can pick that up just by feeling it. And I need a little bit of assistance right now and that's what we're trying to gain through the computer stuff. Depending on the program, some computers receive data from some 30 different sensors that can be placed around the car. In fact, the info is instantaneous. It allows the driver to see exactly what he should feel. I seen something there that I wanted to, to show Jeff, so I held the screen while he, and he was getting in the car and I had him look over on the screen, but uh, actually just showing where the travel of the wheels, what was happening, you know, for a complete lap. It had the whole uh, lap up on the screen and let him know what's actually happening with the car in the center of the corner, which is what we're having a little bit of trouble with now. And, uh, Give him, try to give him a little insight, something to think about while he was on the racetrack. Need to work on the accelerator pedal. Just like bend it and bring it closer to me. Uh, and need to work on the steering column. It's got to be leaking out quite a bit. Ten four. Burton and Wallace weren't the only drivers there testing. Butch Miller was there in a super truck, as well as Joe Rutman. And this was a surprise. In fact, it was a shock. Ernie Irvin strapped in and went for a few laps. He put the hammer down, went nose to tail, then door to door with Joe Rutman before finally passing him. It was his first pass since the crash, and it was a thrill to everyone there, including Ernie. 
My biggest thing was uh, trying to worry about if I could actually judge the distance between them. But, uh, you know, we ran side by side. No problem to me. It didn't really seem like it, you know, and, and that's something that, you know, uh, just you have to get out there and do it. I think it proves to himself and everybody else that he can he can still do it. Obviously, he knew he, he knew he could. So for Ernie Irvin, he passed his test with flying colors. For Mike Wallace and Jeff Burton, they won't receive their grades until the April 9th First Union 400. Well, time will tell how much benefit the driver and the teams got from testing at North Wilkesboro. Well, our time's up for today. Hope you enjoyed the show, and our thanks to Robert Yates and all the folks for allowing us to come in here. You join us again here on TNN for more on Inside Winston Cup Racing. Today's show has been brought to you by Texaco Haviland Formula 3 Motor Oil. Add more life to your car. Cold-filtered Miller Genuine Draft, making the world a very cool place. And by Goodyear, number one in racing, number one in tires. Drivers, race teams, and race fans, the new season is here, and now's the time to get your copy of the 1995 Team Simpson catalog. Call 1-800-71-RACING and join Team Simpson today. The official conversion van of Inside Winston Cup Racing is Gladiator by Glavelle. America's number one luxury van, Glavelle. The way we put it together sets us apart. 